the approach to harvest is always characterized by waiting. Farmers wait for full growth, maturity, and yield. As much as they might like to plant seeds one day and reap the next, they know that reaping a harvest is a process of time. They must plant a seed and then be persistent and patient, fully expecting a harvest in time. But this kind of waiting can't afford to be the twiddling of thumbs, uh, a kind of passive wait. This wait must be active. There are things to do, like weeding, and steps that must be taken to ensure a healthy harvest. And then there are decisions to be made and opportunities to explore post-harvest. Revelation 21 from 1 to 5 is a reminder for us today of what we are waiting for in kingdom terms. We read of a new heaven and a new earth. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. What a picture and what a hope. But what about now? What happens while we wait? Well, Luke 17 from verse 21 at 20 and 21 um, is a reminder that there is little time for passivity while we wait. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words, there is little time for passivity or inactivity while we wait, because the king, to be fully revealed in Revelation 21, is already on his throne, reigning right now. But as Jesus informed the Pharisees in Luke 17, when they inquired or possibly even demanded that he provide them with proof of the kingdom, this kingdom he constantly spoke about and of which he claimed to be king or Messiah, the kingdom of God was not about to arrive with the same trappings or paraphernalia or pomp and ceremony as an earthly kingdom. And by the same measure, neither would it be accompanied by the same constraints and limitations as an ordinary or even extraordinary earthly kingdom. The Pharisees' question presumed that the kingdom of God was yet to come and that it would be visible like an earthly kingdom. But God's kingdom is so much more than earthly kingdoms. The embodied king of the kingdom defies all earthly comparison and surprises us at every turn precisely because he is not the usual suspect. And his kingdom would not be visibly here or there in the same way as other earthly kingdoms, regardless of the expectations of the Pharisees. Somewhat like the seed and the harvest, the kingdom is now and not yet. It's current reality, but there is a fullness that is still to come. God reigns today, but one day his reign will be globally visible. Like the Pharisees and believers of old, we live in challenging times, characterized by death, mourning, crying, and pain. The very opposite of what is promised in Revelation 21. And like them, we hope that God will intervene and bring about a better world. We long to be liberated from our very human struggles and fears. But instead of waiting until all is revealed, we can experience and express signs of the kingdom now, today. Because the kingdom of God is among or even possibly within them as it is for us. While we wait for the full expression of the kingdom described in Revelation 21, we are invited to participate in spreading and introducing the kingdom reign of our king. Wherever we can through expressions of love, care and commitment, and precisely because the kingdom of heaven is among or indeed within us in a world where the kingdom seems far away and even absent at times, we are the place it opens up into the earth. 
We are the place where God's kingdom is manifested. As we live out of his rule, it is manifest. As we pray, it is manifest. And as we follow the leading of the spirit and engage in whatever he's doing, it is made manifest. When we listen to the news, we can easily feel overwhelmed. Nothing seems to be peaceful or joyful. God's activity seems to be, have disappeared. But God's presence and his kingdom is still active. Every time somebody acts out of love, every time something is put right and justice is served, no matter how small, God's kingdom is experienced and expressed where there's beauty. God's kingdom is experienced and expressed in so many different ways that are evident of his rule. Every now and again, farmers have to adopt new approaches, design new tools, and change their mindsets in order to work in an environment that is fundamentally changing. Now, those who wrestle with the worst effects of climate change understand this. I believe we stand at the crossroads of such a moment today. For us, our job description remains the same. It's to experience God's kingdom, rule within us, and to express God's kingdom intentions around us. The approach and the tools we use to do this may need to adapt to our new reality and to the demands of a changing environment. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit is already at work in the world around us. So our task is simply to find out what he's doing and to join in. So what are your next steps? What about my next steps? Perhaps the most important step of all in some ways is a step back rather than a step forward. It's important that we take that step back because in the West in particular, we live life with our faces facing forward, so focused on the future, so eager to see what lies ahead that we barely take a second glance at the past behind us. This means that we hardly ever really learn from the past or ask ourselves strategic questions about how we can improve on the past. Now, I was born in, in, in Ghana. I'm a child of two worlds, both the UK and uh, West Africa. And in my cultural tradition, we have this word, Sankofa, which is represented symbolically by a bird that's looking back with an egg in its mouth while it's flying forward. And the idea behind this word is retrieval. It conveys the, the idea that positive progress is impossible until we bring critical knowledge from the past into the present. Now, the Hebrew prophets understood this. Um, Christians often think that they were obsessed with the future, but they were actually far more interested in squeezing uh, the, every last bit of learning they could from the past. In Hebrew thought, the key to the future lay in the past. In other words, the past was ahead in full view. It's a little bit like sitting on a, on a train facing the direction that you've just come from. The past is in full view in front of you and the future is behind you, unseen. And as you look at the past and the journey that you've taken with God, it gives you indications and brings clarity about the future that you have not yet seen, that you're moving into. The prophet was only able to speak to the issues of their day, not because they had an eye to the future, but because they had an eye to the past and the journey they'd already taken with God. If you want to know what the Holy Spirit is up to today, you may be surprised to find the answers in the past. Many of us have not really looked back since COVID began. We have been waiting, mostly for it to pass. Some of us just surviving, others of us planning for the future. But God has been at work, and there are steps we're being called to take. It's only as you look back that you discover the nature of the journey you've already taken with God as a community, as a church, as an organization. And what about your family? What is the nature they have made over this challenging season? What's the nature of the journey they've made? And what about you as an individual? 
What have you learned from this past season that will enable you to sow more efficiently, invest more wisely, so that you can nurture and support others beyond yourselves more meaningfully? I don't know about you, but as I look back, especially during lockdown, there was a lot to learn. Hopefully we've learned as believers that we need to be more empowering, more collaborative, more inclusive, and more diverse, ethnically, culturally, etc. And that we need to be oriented to addressing the kind of issues that have been highlighted during COVID, such as the increasing gap between the world's richest and poorest, the climate crisis, the global nature of racism, domestic abuse, and the dangers of celebrity cultures in churches and Christian organizations. I'm sure you could add your own. So if as believers we really want to know what to do next, pause, take a step back before you take a step forward. Learn everything you can from where you've been, from what God did and said, how he did it. Learn from what you observed about others, their needs and their possibilities, as well as your needs and your possibilities, and then prepare for your first step. I believe we allow the reign of God to come into effect when the church embraces the incredible opportunity to model a Christ-like approach to a watching world. When we reclaim territory around truth, integrity, justice, salvation. When we embrace the opportunity to speak in fresh ways to the full spectrum of human experience, tragedy, pain, loss, through to recovery, renewal, and hope. We can also demonstrate the value of learning from those we've traditionally believed need to learn from us. They have so much to teach us. Persecuted church, the church living in uncertain, unstable conditions. We can learn from them. As you consider uh, partners overseas and at home, commit yourselves not just to give to them, but also to learn from them. As we come alongside them and take steps towards recovery together in the face of the climate crisis, the dehumanizing effects of material poverty, etc., let's commit ourselves to embrace the reality that the kingdom of God is among all of us, is within all of us. And we can express the reign of God much like the farmers, the task for us is, is the same today as it has ever been. To sow and reap. The kingdom is now and not yet. But we have a part to play in the now. In order to take our next steps, we must recognize what God has been highlighting for us. So step back, see the bigger picture. Keep an eye on the past, move into the future, and reveal the reign of our King. Let's pray together. So Lord, we are so grateful to you that the kingdom is already here. It's amongst us. It's within us. We pray for your grace to wait actively to take steps that are needed. Help us to see the journey we've taken with you, to pause, to step back, to see that journey, and help us then to step forward, to take action, to engage with the confidence that the kingdom will be manifest as we do so. We thank you that you've called us to be kingdom people. We thank you that you are on your throne. In the midst of everything, you rule and reign. And we thank you that we are co-workers together with Christ in the coming season. Bless us as we put one foot ahead of the other and step into all you have for us. 
We pray it in Jesus' name. We pray for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. Amen.